I'm Dr. Alan Perel, and this is Conversations in Medicine. I'm Dr. Alan Perel, and this is Conversations in Medicine. This program brings cutting edge medical topics to the Staten Island and tri state community. Tonight's topic is depression. Depression is the number one cause of disability of people between the ages of 15 and 44. Over $210 billion in lost time are people who are depressed. There are 16 million people in the United States with depression, about 5% of the population. I have a wonderful group of guests here, and I want to thank you all for being here. Dr. Alexander Zevarinsky, who is the Associate Medical Director of Outpatient Psychiatric Psychiatry at Richmond University Medical Center. Thank you for coming. Susan Perel, an LCSW counselor, clinician, and my wonderful and lovely mm -hmm. wife. And Dr. Tuzine Shakir, an attending psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. So we have a wonderful panel here, and we're going to talk about something that is very common and things that affect people's lives very, very much, and that's depression. So in, in the idea of depression, maybe I'll even say before we talk about depression, I've mentioned everybody's got different positions and different titles. So tell us, what's the difference between a psychiatrist, psychologist, social worker, counselor? Maybe Alex, you could start with us a little bit. Sure, well, the main thing is education, how long you spend in school also. So just our psychiatrist, basically the same as four years of medical school and then a subspecialty in psychiatry which is usually four years and then plus minus a year or two for fellowship. Uh, as far as psychologists, you know, that title is given to a couple of people. The social worker could be considered a uh, you know, therapist and psychologist could be considered a therapist. You know, there's a social worker at master's level, then you know, the two years of education as well as a PhD which is a four year education and usually the PhD psychologists do uh, dissertation. Uh, as far as treating patients, I think the line is very thin, that most of them just experience, so the more you work with people, the better you get. So as far as, you know, you could go so far in school, but the actual having a therapist could be a social worker, could be better than a PhD psychologist. It's just a matter of how good are Different you Different people. So sure. Susan, tell me a little bit, counselors. What, what, when, as a physician, sometimes we think about, you know, the psychiatrists are people who can prescribe medicines. Right. Psychologists, social workers don't prescribe medicines and they do different things, but how does everybody work as a team? Okay, so the way that social workers look at it is that doctors follow a bit something called a medical model where they look at the patient with mind-body connection and medicines they're on and their uh, medical, the test results, their blood work and how this all comes, the genetics and how it comes together to make a diagnosis and start a treatment that's usually related to a, thera a, a, a therapy or a medicine. A social worker looks at a person more as how they're connected to society, their family, what we call it systems, what systems they're in, in in the community. They have a work group, that's a system, a family, who they're, they're different um, identities, they're a mother, a wife, or a husband, a, what, a partner, whatever it might be. And, and we prov the social worker provides more of a liaison, uh, thinks of themselves as a liaison to help them guide through these different identities in a society in different systems but also to pro provide s uh, actual counseling psychotherapy and to try to relate the different disciplines and be a liaison to bring it all together for the best treatment for the person okay and we're going to get to how the team works together because clearly there are people who see both a psychiatrist and a counselor and a social worker so Tuzine, tell us a little bit pa patients every day people sometimes feel blue they're mm -hmm. a little upset you know, there's things that are going on in their homes, you know, sad things that are happening. You read, read about what's going on on, on on television. How do we make a diagnosis of depression versus someone who's just sad for a short period of time? Right. Um, as you said, that um, 
people can feel sad every day or for different situations. We call it situational sadness or situational anxiety. It doesn't mean that they are clinically depressed. Uh, to be clinically depressed, they have to be in a persistent state of mind. Either they are uh, persistent sadness and uh, inability to enjoy things, and then it start affecting their daily routine. They are not able to perform their everyday functions. And this sadness and inability to enjoy things is associated with a lot of other symptoms. For example, people have problem with sleep. They have difficulty falling asleep, staying asleep. They lose their appetite. There is a weight loss. They feel hopeless, helpless, worthless about themselves. A lot of guilt feelings, low self-esteem, and sometimes it becomes so bad that they start thinking life is not worth living and what's the point of living. When people have all these uh, different symptoms, we diagnose them with depression. And we use different um, uh, diagnostic criteria, which is TSM-5. So when they meet a TSM means what? Diagnostic, diagnostic statistical, statistical manual. Right. We use that manual to diagnose them with depression. Okay. Yeah. So Alex, who gets depressed? Well, anybody could get depressed. You know. uh -huh. I think not a single person doesn't feel depressed at any particular given time of their life. It's a matter of, you know, like I mentioned, situation of depression and how long it lasts. If uh, the stressor is, you know, lingers long enough, after a while, because of the biochemical changes in your body, and usually a little more than two weeks, that could potentially disturb the equilibrium, and that causes clinical depression. And that's actually one of the things we look for in the time frame. So if you're feeling this way more than two weeks, that's more likely to be clinical depression versus something that's happening like situational or something going on in your life. Mm -hmm. So when we deal with this, Again, back to who gets depressed. You said everyone gets depressed, but let's go back to the clinical diagnosis of depression. Who should diagnose it? I mean, anyone can diagnose depression, and um, it can be an internist, um, uh, psychologist, obstetrician, gynecologist, and um, basically in a lot of the clinics, they are using one scale. We call it BDI. It's a back depression inventory. So that's a questionnaire. That's a questionnaire. So you go through so all the questions exactly. and say how you're doing. If you, if you are positive for a lot of the questions, it means someone has depression. And then that specialist can send this patient to a psychologist, social worker, or a, psych a psychiatrist. So tell us, about, we, you, we mentioned to me before about postpartum depre uh, depression and the genetics of depression. So tell me about postpartum depression. Well, are there any groups that are, that are more prone to feeling depressed? Younger people, older people, said postpartum? Um, well, postpartum depression is something that has been com becoming more popular, that uh, there's awareness, people are more uh, knowledgeable, that there are some women that have, that experiences, they call it, they used to call it the baby blues, after giving birth, but sometimes it goes further than that, and it goes much deeper, and it takes it goes on for a long period of time where intervention is is required, and there are really good treatments for it, and um, it's something that now the obstetricians are screening for. So that's a big change in our society for treatment and for women, for empowerment of women, because uh, years ago pe women would just suffer right. uh, in silence. And, and there are certain factors which can cause postpartum depression. Um, uh, genetics always plays a big role. If you are born with the genes for depression or postpartum depression, people can depress, but it also depends on uh, your pregnancy. If a pregnancy is difficult, if there are comorbidities, comorbidities in pregnancy like gestational diabetes, preeclampsia, difficult pregnancy, lack of social support, uh, marital issues, all these things can affect and uh, make a person prone to depression, postpartum so depression. You mentioned genetics, I'll go to you, Alex. Tell me about the genetics of it. If, if my mom and dad had, gen had depression, is it likely I will? You have increased chance of having mm -hmm. depression, that's correct. Also, it doesn't just have to be your first generation relatives, it could be a second generation the grandparents, uncles, uncles, cousins, it all plays a factor. The more genetic loading you have, the higher chance you are to become depressed. And not just you know, postpartum depression, depression in general. One of the key things is just to realize it's multifactorial. So even though that you do have genetic loading, which means that you, you do have family that have psychiatric illness, and actually they, are, they go back and forth. It doesn't have to be just depression. If let's say somebody in your family have bipolar disorder, you're increased risk of having depression and bipolar. Bipolar is a little higher, but nevertheless, you know, your chance of just having any kind of mental illness increases. With that being said, uh, 
you could have two parents that are severely depressed and that person, the individual doesn't have to be depressed even though they have the genes for it. It, mm -hmm. it has to do a lot also what's going on in the environment and you know, the question again, nurture versus nature. Interesting, I'm a neurologist mm -hmm. and I deal with the brain. You guys deal with the brain. So a lot of patients come to me and think that I know what you guys do because I deal with the brain. And they come up and they, they have this interesting comment that depression is because the chemicals in the brain are not in balance. And, that all and that's yeah. sort of what depression is. Right. I think there's more to it than just that. There are neurotransmitters, a lot of the chemicals that I deal with, with neurological disorders like Parkinson's disease, which is dopamine, or Alzheimer's disease, which is called acetylcholine and serotonin has effects with regard to depression and migraine headaches. So there's a lot of things that we, we overlap with it. So tell me, what do you, as a neurologist, when I, when I have these, when I have patients coming in with, with neurological disorders and I see that they're also depressed, how do we work as a team in order to try to treat it? You know, that, that becomes a very gray area just because we do share a lot of diagnosis, including the cognitive disorders, like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disorder, disease. Uh, it, the best way is calibration. We just have to be in, in contact with each other and pretty much discuss uh, the patient as a whole. Because you know, we have to know what you have to know what I'm doing and vice versa. Because if not, then we're just adding medication, and this way, you know, a lot of things get lost in translation. And that happens a lot, unfortunately, just because there's so many specialties out there. Even though psychiatry and neurology are so close together, they're actually miles apart as well. So uh, some psychiatrists are more comfortable treating. Uh, Parkinson's disease, for example, and some neurologists are more comfortable treating depression than average, but it's still very separated. So every time somebody has a neurological disorder, most psychiatrists tend to refer right away. And I, I believe that's the same way, and correct me if I'm wrong, for the neurologist. Absolutely. As, as soon as mm -hmm. oh, you're depressed, you have to go see your, your psychiatrist. Uh, in fact, that is, it could be as simple as just picking up the phone and calling the other provider and seeing what, what they think. And what's interesting, what I think about the neurochemistry and why they keep on saying that is because if I do a test, think about a CAT scan or an MRI. We talk about the most sophisticated pictures that we have of the structure of the brain. They're almost always normal. Mm -hmm. So we don't see something, we don't see a part of the brain that's not working, at least on a structural level. So let's jump into medications and treatments. So a big part, everyone here has heard of Prozac. Everyone's heard of different medicines for it. And we want to change the chemical milieu or the composition or the balance of different neurotransmitters or chemicals in the brain. So Jazeen, tell me a little bit do, about the history of, of, of medicines for depression. It's been going on for a lot of years, and I think we've gotten better over time. Tell exactly. us about it. Um, for depression, when, whenever we treat depression, it's just not the medication. It's the combined strategy. We do a lot of things to treat depression. Like whenever we diagnose depression, we look at three main factors, and we call them biopsychosocial. So biological factors where medication plays a role, psychological factors where therapy plays a role, and then social factors where social workers, they play a role to work on the social issues. And when we talk about medications, there are different groups of medications. And um, the, we call it like first line treatment for depression. We treat people with first line medications which are SSRIs, like you said, Prozac, Effexor, Paxil, all this group of medications. If, if patients don't respond to the well, first medication, then we add another one, or if there is a um, partial response, we add another medication and we call it add-on medication. And after that, there are other strategies like we do augmentation by using uh, different medications to augment the antidepressants. And, um, and with the medication, use of therapy plays a big role, different kind of therapies like cognitive behavior therapy, dialectical behavior therapy, and combining all these strategies together can treat depression. So uh, sometimes when you think about someone who's depressed, Sometimes as, as a neurologist and sometimes mm -hmm. even a primary care physician, you sort of think of it as like a cookbook. You know, there's, someone comes in, Mrs. Smith is depressed, I'm going to use this drug, I'm going mm -hmm. to use that drug. So tell me the art of psychiatry a little bit. You know, for our audience who, who's here, who are here to listen and try to say, what does a psychiatrist do that's different? And we'll talk about the counseling in a few moments. But is every person who come in get drug X first and then drug Y second? And as Dr. Shakir was saying, we use this and then we use that in different ways. Is there a cookbook approach or do you look at every individual and figure out wh what to do? So tell us a little bit what goes, in on, you know, goes be, on in your mind. It would be very nice to have a cookbook and saying mm -hmm. if somebody comes in right. and this is showing this is what you get, unfortunately it's a lot more complicated than mm -hmm. that. And just by looking at the individual, we're so different, even though we're so alike at the same time, that picking the right medication could be 
a science. And unfortunately, it's not as very direct science. A lot of times it's poking and probing and you know, sometimes you get it the first time and sometimes not. And that has to do a lot also with the genetics of the people, mm -hmm. or person rather. So for example, Prozac has a interaction with, with the liver enzyme 2D6. So if an uh, individual, which is about 5% of the population, has uh, slow metabolites, then if you give them a milligram dosing that's normal for somebody, it might give them an adverse reaction, well, it might not. So if that happens, then you start having to readjust. There are some genetic testings that we could do, but it's a very expensive test, and usually the insurance won't pay for it, and it's very minimally helpful to us. Uh, as far as, uh, going back to the original question, as far as the cookbook, you know, the best way to do it is just look at the person as a whole, uh, look as a person as far as what their other medical comorbidities are, and just start to see, because a lot of times we do use, and I'm sure in neurology as well, in psychiatry, we use the side effects as a positive for us. So if somebody is having lack of sleep with depression and I'm using a medication that's very sedating, that's a good thing for that particular person. But if somebody is sleeping well and they get on something that's sedating, they might be groggy in the morning. So to answer your question, no, that's not necessarily a cookbook. So we want to try to find the right medicine for the right person. Correct. Same way as your internist finds a medicine for diabetes, hypertension, mm -hmm. and it's not they say use one, two, and three. So now I'm going to get into a little bit more of the counseling, the interaction with, with the patient and the family. And, and tell me a little bit about the family. We haven't mentioned the family with regard to someone who's depressed. A lot of times the family will bring someone into my office, different offices, and say, you know, my mom, my dad, my brother, my sister, my, my son, my daughter, they look depressed to me. And we do some, inven some questions, some inventories, and say, you know what, I really do believe that's the case. If someone goes to a psychiatrist and is referred, as, a, as we were hearing about this counseling, this, uh, this team approach with right. counseling. So tell me the counseling part of it. We talked about different medicines. Tell me the different approaches that we have. So when a social worker first sees a client, there's an assessment that's done um, that when we, you know, clearly we're referred from a psychiatrist or a center or something or a family brings them in. So we make an assessment. We can use tools like questionnaires as well and we gather information and we try to make an assessment of what the treatment plan is going to be and very specifically what the goals are because working toward those goals keeps the therapy very focused and as a group it's decided what type of therapeutic modality would be most beneficial but we can also refer out a social worker could refer out not only for the therapy that they're providing but for support groups or for other interventions that may be Alcoholics Anonymous or whatever other resources are needed so there's a lot going on in the first few sessions of getting information um, you know trying to we call it pairing so when a social worker first meets the client, there's this little bond that slowly builds up and there has to be some sort of trust and chemistry and that, that takes place over time mm -hmm. in order for the therapy to be productive and successful. And um, then it's determined what type of therapeutic modality. There's different modalities today. There's psychodynamic, there's cognitive behavioral, there's all different types. And How would you explain some of that to, to the people? Well, audience? psychodynamic is more like a traditional therapy. And the different therapists have different skill sets. But most of us, in general, um, use um, like an armamentarium of what we think the person needs and we sort of pull out that depending upon the person, their personality, their prior experience with, ther with therapy and uh, what we think would work best for them with their goals, related to their goals. So psychodynamic is basically um, talking about their feelings, their history. We Social workers look for something called trauma. So they had a traumatic experience in childhood or something happened or there was a car accident or their life, their parents suddenly died. So the goal is to go back to that trauma and try to reframe it and try to have a different understanding of it so they could put it in the past and be free to move forward in their lives without that trauma pu pulling them back all the time. And then there's CBT, I'm sorry, Cognitive yeah. Behavioral Therapy, which is more also very goal specific there's a it, there's like a model where they say there's a there's an incident that happens your body your mind reacts and then then there's emotions and there's physiological aspects to it and the thing is to try to change the that process to change how you're going to react and how ultimately you you respond and to try to, ch to do the reframing that everything's not negative some things you have to look at it in a different light and just try to open up our minds to that yeah how interesting I know that that <laughs> listening to you for hearing that a lot. So, so let me ask you some myths of psychiatry 
myths of social work. People out there believe that if you go to a psychiatrist, they're going to ask you about your mother, your relationship with your mother and your father on whatever level as a child. Does that always happen? Okay, so it's, uh, well, I was trained in a type of therapeutic modality called client-centered. So I, n I don't go into that. I, m I get a basic history of like where they were born and basic things, but it's, so I allow the, the client to, to bring out the information and we call it a dance. They do, you watch their dance, the, what they, what's important to them, what they say, their, their style, how they think. And I don't typ typically go into all of that unless they start to. There are peop right. people will show you who they are. They show you their process. They show you their thoughts. And I try to not put my therapeutic ideas on them, but to follow their, who they are and their routine and make the modality match to who they are, how they think, what, the, where, what their goals are, and how to get them there. Do you think as psychiatrists that, all, that patients with depression all need medicine? And how long do they need medicine for? No, so definitely not. So one of the biggest things that I know is being in practice is that a lot of people come in and they, they relate that their fear is that they, you know, we're going to be pushing medication on them. Uh, but the fact is that not everybody needs medication. Some people get away with therapy. Some people might need both. Some people might require therapy and medication management. But as far as just talking depression as a whole, uh, after the first episode of depression, after six months of treatment, it's reasonable to come off medication, and the chance of relapse is about 20%, which is not, not so bad. Uh, it becomes progressively worse as time goes on, so if you have a second episode of depression, then we wait about a year, and then after that, your chance of having a relapse is about 40%. So after the third time of a uh, depressive episode, we just say, you know, it's time to stay on the medication indefinitely, just because coming off the medication is a very high chance of you having depression, and therefore, it might, you know, have negative outcomes in your life. So I'm going to go ahead a little bit because I want to go into more of the intractable patients. So say someone doesn't do well with the medicines, and I know there's multiple medicines and newer medicines out there. We can go over different names, but again, your psychiatrist will know because the level of sophistication. What do you do if someone doesn't do well with, with medication? Um, other um, treatments are like uh, electro, uh, ECT. So that's shock therapy. That's so shock so therapy. So people are very concerned. They think about shock therapy. Those are induced seizures you know, mm -hmm. in a controlled setting. Is it dangerous? It's very safe. There is no contraindication. It's even used in uh, pregnancy and also in elderly people. So it's a safe treatment. It is a safe treatment, mm -hmm. but clearly there's a stigma associated yeah. for over years. Can I say, I've actually Please. observed ECT shock treatment because uh, I was very concerned when I had patients who were getting mm -hmm. this type of treatment and all the horror stories I had heard in graduate school and my training. And I actually went to the treatment areas and observed it. It was extremely humane. It, the, it's just a little twitching in a hand right. when I, the ones I watched. Mm -hmm. And the person is fine after, fine during. There's no, it's very quick. There's, you know, there's a, a lot of supervision around. I was actually very, sh and I saw such good results with right. some people that had suffered for years. It was mm -hmm. very, very interesting, I thought. That is interesting. Mm -hmm. Alex, tell me about TMS. So, so TMS, TMS is, is, a, right. is a new technology. Mm -hmm. It's something different. And maybe tell us what the initials stand for. And I know, I know, I, I'm, the, <laughs> sure. I'm sorry, I'll give you the whole thing. I know Staten Island is getting the, some systems that, or system at least, with, uh, that do this transcranial magnetic stimulation. Right. So just to tell you what the TMS is. And tell us, what does it have to do with ECT, depression, anything like that? So let me go back to ECT for just two minutes just to kind of wrap it up a little bit. So. As far as ECT, the best way to kind of understand it is it resets your hard drive. Mm -hmm. uh, I think all the stigma from ECT is that during the 30s, 40s, when it just starts start being used a lot, uh, then there's no anesthesia. So it does induce a seizure, so it kind of could be kind of scary to watch. Person, you know, inducing a seizure, they're going all over the place, they're, they have to be held down by multiple right. people. And I think the second uh, part of the stigma is the one floor cuckoo's nest. I think that mm -hmm. that movie kind of Put it on the map, and everybody after that, because all my the snake pit also. I you probably before I your time, I heard which was it. horrendous. So yeah. all my patients that I refer to ECT, they always tell me, no, I'm not doing the cuckoo's nest ECT. Right, right. So you have to explain to them. And now uh, there's anesthesia. People, you know, patients usually don't remember the actual episode, but even if they do, it's usually you know they're they're out for a couple of minutes, and then they wake up. And you're right. So that actual twitching is the actual seizure activity, which we're, we're looking for. And as I just jump back to TMS, so ECT, even though with the anesthesia, it sounds pretty invasive. You still have to get anesthesia, you still have to get shock into your brain. The TMS actually doesn't. So it doesn't penetrate, there's no electric shock. It's actually magnetic waves that create the sound. And we stimulate the prefrontal cortex, and 
To the front of the brain. To the front of the brain, that's correct. And uh, it penetrates probably three centimeters deeper in than... So you say penet but it penetrates with its sound. It doesn't, sound, it just right. barely touches it you or doesn't touch you. Right. It's not invasive it's at all. Right. It's, yeah, it doesn't need an anesthesiologist. It you know, doesn't need much. It's a very safe system. There, you know, there was a, some potential side effects, but uh, we could talk about it if you like a little later. Or I could but the side that. effects overall are minimal. Mild, minimal. mild to minimal. Again, we'd have to always talk to your doctor about that or the person performing the TMS. Mm -hmm. you know, everything, you know, we're not saying that there's no side effects to anything, but, but clearly they're, they're relatively low, the number of side effects with it. O almost non-existing. So that's pretty good. That's right. almost non-existent. Mm -hmm. Seems pretty low. And before someone would go to ECT, would you consider TMS, or would you, where I would you I think they're, they're a little it? different. Uh, e ECT is still the gold standard for uh, medication resistant depression. However, a lot, it's a, a lot of people will won't want to do ECT, it's a good other choice. So just to give you some statistics on the TMS, so they, there's three big studies done by multiple different vendors of the TMS. Uh, they show from treatment resistant depression anywhere from 15 to 40%, depending on the study you're looking, uh, that's some benefit and up to 30% of full remission. Wow. And that's that's huge considering mm -hmm. for, you know, for people who didn't do well with the medicine. That's so correct. I'm gonna move ahead a little bit. So in, in medical school, it was always the thing when you were a third year medical student and they, they said to the students, and I was a student in medical school in Brooklyn at SUNY Downstate, they said, you have to ask the patient if they want to kill themselves. And every medical student said, I can't ask them that question because the patient's going to say, that's it. Mm -hmm. If I only knew, that's the answer to my problems. And the psychiatrist would tell us, no, that's just not a suggestion. But you have to ask because sometimes it's in the back of people's minds and it's part of what you do. When do we hospitalize patients? Um, um, <coughs> People can present with severe depression, but not anyone, everyone needs a hospitalization. If there, there is a criteria, if someone is not able to take care of themselves, they need to be in the hospital, or if they are danger to self or others. For example, if they, are, hurt, so if they are suicidal or homicidal, they need to be in the hospital. And you ask them? We ask them, yeah, ask that's them the must question. So tell me, I know you do a lot of work in the hospital, outpatient, but you will, I'm, I've known you a long time in the hospital. Tell me about what, what's the environment in the hospital? We only have about a minute left. But what, in the hospital, everyone is afraid of that cuckoo's nest concept. What, what's the humanity? What type of process goes on in the hospital? So there's two different processes. So we're looking at somebody that's in, admitted to the medical floor and the psychiatrist is a consult, or somebody comes into the psychiatric emergency room, which is a two different processes usually. But as far as we're talking about admitting, or just the hospital itself. What's it like in the hospital? Is, this, is it a scary place? It could appear very scary because, especially the psychiatric emergency room, you come in, the door locked behind you, and you can't leave. That, that, that's very scary. But does everybody that comes into the psychiatric the emergency room get admitted? No. I would say majority of people get discharged. Uh, only very severely ill psychiatric patients get admitted. So we're really here to help. I mean, that, sure. the point I'm saying is a neurologist who goes to the psychiatric unit you know, to see patients there, we're really there to help. And the, the, the people are very helpful, encouraging, caring, and things like that. And that's really, we want to take the fear, up from, from what my wonderful audience, I want to take out the fear of psychiatry. The stigma, maybe. The stigma, stigma. that's a better word. That's why you might laugh. <laughs> so so that's, that's what's so wonderful about doing it. And to show that depression is a treatable process. Exactly. If there's anything that I could say is we want you, if you're feeling depressed, to go to your doctor, whether it's your internist, gynecologist, get a referral to your psychiatrist if necessary, seek counseling in order to get the proper treatment. And if medicines don't work, there are other things that will work. TMS without doing the ECT, ECT if, if need be, but there are multiple things we could do. I want to thank you all. It was a very quick half hour. Learned a lot about depression. Mm -hmm. Thank you all for coming. And thank, thank you. Have a good thanks. night.